my recording to this computer. Well, it is good to be with you, Jason. Uh, this is Jason Whitehead, Reverend Dr. Jason Whitehead, who I've had the privilege of knowing for several years now through my work at ILIF and then out in the community and now with Juniper Formation. And I get to see his work with his wonderful um, organization, Mosaic Insight. He is the web guru, he is the counselor, pastor, consultant, all the things as many entrepreneurial ministries are these days. And Jason has a fantastic role in um, Juniper Formation as he helps navigate their um, really discernment um, cohorts and um, just walks alongside a lot of folks. In addition, Jason has his licensed clinical social work um, background and is somebody who has journeyed with folks through grief and fear and life transitions in many ways. And so we are grateful to have him as part of our series around life discussions during times of COVID-19 safety measures. And so Jason, I'm grateful to have you um, join with us today and I will hand it over to you to begin and then we'll have a bit of a conversation. Wonderful, thank you, Morgan. And it's, it's uh, wonderful to be with everybody, of course, uh, everybody meaning whoever happens upon this video or whoever happens to watch the video up until the point where I say it's good to be with all of you. Um, so we thought we would start the conversation a bit today talking about, about fear, which is uh, an emotion that's, uh, I guess if an emotion is near and dear to my heart, this one is one because I've spent a lot of time with it. Uh, my background and my work at ILIF revolved around studying fear a good bit. Um, and, and it's an emotion that is really important to understand, especially in a time like this, uh, where there's a lot of uncertainty, where you know, we can uh, read or turn to various news sources and feel like we are threatened by what happens or, or what we're reading. Um, and so what I, I, I thought I would kind of begin and, and talk about a little bit is, is how do we recognize when we're afraid? Uh, because there, there are certain biological things, there are certain things our body does when we're afraid. And, you know, the simple fact of, of things are is that we're all going to be afraid from time to time. Our, our bodies are set up, our brains are set up to, to be afraid. Um, it, it's what protects us in the environment. Fear is, is, you know, quite possibly one of our most adaptive emotions because mm. it, it's meant to help us preserve ourselves when something is going on around us that, that we don't understand, something is, is going on around us that feels like it would in some way intrude or be invasive in our lives. And so a lot of us probably know about the, the behaviors that we associate with fear. And those behaviors are you know, fight, flight, uh, freeze, uh, appease is a, a fourth behavior in there mm. uh, as well that most people don't talk about, but, but that's the, the one where we just kind of agree to every, everything or everybody that's going on around mm. us because our, our, uh, our minds usually feel so threatened. That, that we would rather not stand out because the threat to our identity is, is too great. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, there, there are accompanying emotions, accompanying behaviors with fight. We, you know, we see a lot of anger. We see a lot of aggression. Um, mm -hmm. with, with flight, we see a lot of, you know, retreat, some, some sadness, some depression that goes with that. Um, with freeze, it, it, you know, it's really generally that, that behavior of where we're observing the world around us and we don't know what to do. We have so many conflicting kinds of things that our bodies just freeze up. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the, the curious thing about fear in particular. Um, you know, where it comes from in the brain is, is you know, these two little pockets of nerves that are right behind your eyeballs. Um, and those kind of bundles of nerves right there are directly connected to uh, the systems in our body that control muscle behavior, that control our breathing, that, that control 
uh, our capacity to act and, and react in the environment. And so what happens when we're afraid, and, and you've probably felt this before, is that we get tense really quick. Mm -hmm. Our muscles kind of kind of tense up and um, you know the 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 blood draining from your face, you know, when people turn white as a sheep or or they, they turn um, pale. Uh, actually is the blood draining from the top of your body into your limbs so that your muscles can react effectively to a threat in the environment. And so the blood begins to pool in our muscles as they tense up so that we can react to what's going on around us. Uh, and this is what helps our, our ancestors survive, you know, the random lion that they happen upon or uh, the big canyon that they're looking down over, you know, if they're mm -hmm. looking at heights or the, the weird looking snake in the grass that they don't know what to do with. Uh, what also happens is our eyes dilate. So we take in a lot more light and, and we tend to uh, take in more of our surroundings, but we hyper focus on something. In particular, this is why eyewitness accounts um, mm. aren't very reliable. Is is because our eyes get get so wide, but we focus on particular things, and we don't get all the details that are going on because we're focusing on that threat in particular. Mm. Uh, another piece is our digestive system shuts down. Mm -hmm. So so when we're diverting blood from from places in our body our digestive system so so you know you get gut feelings and you get uh tense uh, your gut gets tense in those moments it's because it's shutting down to again to conserve resources for a reaction rather than a response uh, and probably the most um particular things are the most two of the most important things that that we can um, point to when we're afraid is the hyper awareness and the hyper vigilance. Um, and so, you know, if you've ever seen a rabbit freeze, we've got plenty of rabbits up here in Park Hill that just kind of, and, and the moment it sees you, it just kind of stops and stares at you and it just watches you. Um, and, and any movement and it, and it jumps. But it becomes really hyper vigilant or hyper aware of what's going on in its surroundings. Uh, we become hyper vigilant about how do we escape? How do we leave? How do we run from? How do we um, move out of a particular fearful situation? Um, and this is one of the things that I think is, is really particular to this COVID space because we have so much. Um, you know, we have a baseline of information, but a lot of it feels like it changes. Mm. And, and so we become hyper aware or hypersensitive or hyper vigilant about the news or what our neighbors are doing or what are we supposed to be doing. And, and so we kind of freeze in space we become kind of like that rabbit a little bit that just sits there and, and stares at the news without knowing which, you know, which direction to run in or what, what we need to do in that moment. Mm -hmm. um, and and as, as COVID kind of drags on here and, and what is being asked of us changes and continues to change over time, this perpetual state of fear, which is actually really unhealthy for us, pervades. Um, fear in our kind of background as human beings is meant to be really temporary. Mm. It, is, it is meant to be something that, you know, you know, when, I, when I teach about this, it's a quick hit emotion. Mm -hmm. We experience it, we have a particular threat, we react, and then we move on. Mm -hmm. But when we're in this state or in this space of constantly being aware or constantly being vigilant uh, about our own behavior, about others' behaviors, about the, the news, the changing public health information, but we have difficulty letting go of being afraid, which mm -hmm. means that, that our muscles remain kind of tense. 
they, they, they continue to be tense over time. Mm -hmm. uh, our stress reactions are, are heightened. Our awareness of things are, are heightened. And so we react to things that, that we normally wouldn't react to. Um, you know, something that, that a, maybe a child that is now living with us all the time that wouldn't have been a big deal six months ago suddenly becomes huge. Mm -hmm. uh, or a spouse or a partner or a friend or, you know, we see something on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram um, and, you know, our reaction, which would normally feel muted or nowadays would feel muted, what feels normal to us now is probably a little bit of an overreaction because we're trying to find ways to relieve that mm -hmm. stress and relieve mm -hmm. that tension. Um, and, and so part of what becomes important about fear is just recognizing when those certain kind of bodily markers awaken in us. Where, where are we feeling kind of abnormal tension? Um, what are we reading that's causing a re reaction to us? And how can we name what it is that we're feeling in that, that moment? Uh, one of the, the difficult things to, to do, I think, for a lot of people is to, to physically name what they're feeling. <laughs> I, I'm reading this, and this, is, this feels scary, or this makes me angry, or I'm, man, I'm going to celebrate. This is really good news. I feel joy. And that, that capacity to expand our emotional range in many ways becomes important in this time and our capacity to, to really name what it is we're feeling to mark that um, becomes vital to really kind of expressing fully what it is we're experiencing rather than allowing one emotion to, to take over. And, and fear is probably one of the most powerful ones that we have. Um, it's, it's one of the ones that marks our memories mm -hmm. more significantly than other emotions do. Because, you know, again, we're about preserving our lives in, in many ways. And what we're going to remember are the threats that, that threaten to take away something mm -hmm. that's meaningful to us. Mm -hmm. And so those have a priority in our processing. And, and the more that we can kind of counter that fear narrative with other stories from time to time, the better opportunities we have to release some of that, that stress, release some of that tension that um, kind of remains at a low level after we feel like we've, we've been threatened. Uh, for me as a, a theologian and a, and a pastor, you know, we read all sorts of stuff about fear and um, sometimes it's relationship to faith uh, and, and unfortunately I think a lot of the messages that we hear are are really simple about something that is actually pretty complex uh, at the at the end of the day because when uh, when human beings in particular experience the emotion of fear uh, we like to make sense out of things we want to know why we're afraid. We want to know why that's threatening to us. Um, yeah. We want to know the meaning of it. We want to know, you know, we, we want to understand things generally. Um, and, and this is where I think we're different from the rabbit that's sitting in the, you know, sitting on our lawn or, or in the driveway or, or wherever it may be, um, is that we have the capacity to reflect once the situation has passed on what it is that caused us to feel afraid. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and as a, a pastor and a, a, a theologian here, to me, that's the moment when we can begin to understand not what it is we're running from, but what it is we're running toward. Mm -hmm. um, what it is that, that we want to preserve our life for. Is it for another relationship? Is it for a spouse? Is it for a partner? Is it for a child? Is it for a friend, a community? You know, what is it that we're living toward rather than what is it that we're, we're moving away from? Um, 
can be a source for us in our reflections for what it is that we hope for in life. Um, providing, again, a, 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 an alternative story to I'm just scared to I re really hope that, that this can be a part of my life in, mm -hmm. in future moments. Um, mm -hmm. I, I really value this relationship. I really value this time. I really value this experience or this opportunity. And that's not saying every fear that we experience will do that for us. But if we're intentional about naming and understanding where it is it's coming from, there can be some opportunities there to kind of broaden it a little bit and make it more complex than just a simple bodily reaction, mm -hmm. uh, which can also help again with tension and help with stress and help release some of that um, just stuff that, that mm -hmm. clouds how we see the world nowadays mm -hmm. uh, and treat it as a both and rather than an either or. Yeah. Well, I think the, the pieces that I really appreciate about what you just said, one, the appease is new and freeze was new just a few years ago because so often it was just fight or flight, like either. And a lot of the messaging I got growing up was if you weren't strong, you f fled. And if you were strong, you fought, right? And then I was like, well, I don't know. I, I feel like there's a, another. And then when I heard freeze, I was like, oh, that, that makes sense. Because so often we don't know what to do. We're, we're paralyzed in, in decision-making and physicality in those moments sometimes. Even if it's not a physical threat, it can, much like with COVID-19, like it can be like, I don't know what to do, so I'm just going to stay here. Like, I'm not sure what option. And then to hear a piece was really helpful because if you're from a dynamic where you need to, to protect yourself and there's somebody in power that is the one causing that fear, whether that's a relationship or uh, employment, it could be, I know a lot of folks are afraid of losing their jobs and it may not be a healthy scenario right now. And so they're just appeasing their employer, right? Or um, could be just out in society, right? Um, you may not agree with the safety measures, but you are afraid of what might happen. We're hearing a lot of reports starting to come out about physical altercations around social distancing, mask wearing, et cetera. And so it's like, I will appease with whatever needs to happen so that I can get back home. Right. And so I think the helpful piece about knowing that there's really four categories right. around how we might respond, knowing that they're not isolated, that they can interchange yeah. depending on any given scenario, but to have the piece you followed up with, which is how can we name what we're feeling? And I think that's incredibly hard when there is a dominant feeling that kind of doesn't give up. And so if we're feeling fear regularly, how can we inter interject moments of joy or moments of celebration or getting beyond that and say, I'm, I'm actually grieving or I am angry or I am depressed, I am disappointed, I am hopeful. Um, I think a lot of folks might feel foolish in conversations if they admitted they are hopeful about things because they might be the only one expressing it, right? Right. And so I appreciate that, that framework because it allows us to tap in to more than just, I'm afraid. How are we reacting? And then giving framework for how do we actually touch base with ourselves, not just the external, right? right. But right. touch base with our internal self to go, okay, this is actually what I'm feeling. And that can be a whole level of vulnerability that we've either trained ourselves not to tap into for whatever reason, or we may be so exhausted right now that the thought of actually identifying true emotion may feel like it's more than we have capacity for. And yet you've given us entry points to, to start that work. Um, right. I mean, even if, if you, 
even if emotional language is new to you or being able to say that, you know, a lot of times in, in, in therapeutic practice, we'll, we'll just start with four basic words. You know, I feel mad, I feel sad, I feel glad, I feel afraid. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if we can start with, with those kind of four basic, and, and there's some other stuff out, out there that discussed and some other emotions are, are basic to kind of how our brain functions and releases neurochemicals to make us feel better. Um, those four tend to be the, the four that are agreed upon, but if we need practice or we need words, you know, mad, sad, glad, afraid can really provide a base level of how am I reacting to what's going on around me um, and provides the opportunity to say, okay, uh, to, to start to get creative if, if we really want to. Well, um, you know, I'm, I'm not quite glad. This makes me just a little, this makes me smile. This makes me happy. This makes me joyous. I want to celebrate this. Uh, and so we can start to kind of ladder some other words around those, mm -hmm. those particular four. Uh, but once we get those four words down and once we can kind of talk about those, then we can can expand our vocabulary a bit. It's it's um, having those is really a, a, an opportunity and a gateway into uh, expressing ourselves with some vulnerability to folks, but also giving other folks permission to express themselves as well. Mm -hmm. And that that becomes vital in this particular space where we're um, somewhat removed physically. And so it's hard to kind of empathically intuit what people might be feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, when we're spending a lot of time on, on Zoom calls, the, the more that we can kind of name what it is we're feeling, mm. the less energy we're spending on the call trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And so it provides an opportunity, again, to make these kinds of calls a little more vulnerable. Um, and, a, and a little more um, experiential, I think, for, for everybody involved when we can name things rather than tiptoeing around what we, what we might be thinking maybe that someone there could be experiencing based on their facial expressions, how their body is, uh, whether they turn their screen on or off, whether they mute or unmute. Mute and, and those kinds of things. And, and so there's a, a sense of emotional transparency that's possible when we mm -hmm. just kind of get some of the basic stuff down uh, when we're checking in and it allows other people an entree to check in with us. Oh, you're mad. Tell me what mad's about. Mm -hmm. uh, what does yeah. mad look like for you right now? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So yeah, it's a great learning opportunity, but I think it starts, you're right, it starts with the language for ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of appeasing, like you were, were talking about, is that, that um, it really has a lot to do with identity preservation. Mm -hmm. And it's how do I maintain my sense of self when the world around me feels very threatened? How do I not lose who I am? In, in the midst of what's going on, like, like you were talking about. How do I maintain a sense of values and boundaries when work wants X, Y, and Z from me? And not only that, but now, since other people have gone, they want me to do three other jobs. Yeah. And, and we're really quick just to say, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll go and do that. Because the fear and the threat of losing one's own position and, and losing one's right. financial stability and security Security, um, overrides the sense that, hey, this isn't really what I signed up for and I'm not very good at those things. Uh, and it creates a whole nother set of stresses for people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think one of the helpful pieces in this conversation is how can we then parse out some examples as we explore this a little bit further especially with school starting and the 
Groundhog Day experience that is COVID where you wake up and there's something different, but not quite, and you're trying to figure it out, as well as how to display emotions, especially if we've been taught not to. Um, and often that's, that's for, we categorize that to a male tendency that men are taught not to, but really it's any upbringing. It can be family dynamic where you didn't express it. Um, and yet there are different permissions for a um, person who identifies as female to be able to, to enter and start expressing different emotions. Um, and then trying to figure out like, how do we plan during some of this work, knowing that it feels like what's the point of planning when we have no idea if it's going to happen and what does that actually do to our emotions when we don't want to be disappointed. So it's, we'd prefer not to plan at all. And so as we dive into this a little bit more, we'll just kind of pick and, okay. and um, engage in that way, if that works for you. Yeah, no, that's the, that, that was a lot. And, and those are all wonderful directions and I'll look forward to, to talking about it. And, and um, I won't be disappointed with any of those. Great. <laughs>